Um, so as you said, I'm going to talk today about one of the vaccine programmes we're working on at the Jenner Institute, which is where I've been based for the last 10 years. We have a number of vaccines in clinical development against a range of pathogens, um, including outbreak pathogens such as Ebola and flu. Um, and also we're very interested in T cell inducing vaccines as well, which is what I'm going to talk to you a bit about today. So the need for a malaria vaccine is, is clear and well defined. Um, malaria still causes over 600,000 deaths every year in sub-Saharan Africa, mainly in uh, children under the age of five and pregnant women. And despite advances in uh, things like insecticide-treated bed nets and vector control, uh, a, a malaria vaccine would be an extremely helpful part of uh, eliminating malaria from the sub-Saharan uh, uh, region of Africa. So the aims of a malaria vaccine now are defined in the Malaria Vaccine Funders Technology Roadmap, which was uh, last updated in 2013. Um, this is a document put together by the WHO and the various um, charitable and uh, national organisations that fund malaria vaccine development. So the aim is to have a vaccine with 75% efficacy against clinical malaria that would be suitable for administration to at-risk groups, because we, we need to remember that the target for this uh, vaccine will be children under the age of five and ideally very young infants so that we can protect them from malaria before the ages at which they're most at risk. And that's a particular challenge in vaccinology as I'll discuss a little bit more. The other um, way of uh, reducing malaria transmission is to have a, a vaccine that protects um, people from uh, further transmitting the, mosquito, uh, the parasite into the mosquito host. And this would have to be suitable for mass administration campaigns. But that part of the malaria uh, vaccine field is much less advanced than uh, protecting uh, the, the stages that I'm going to talk about today. So this is the um, malaria life cycle, for those of you not familiar with it. It starts here with an infected Anopheles mosquito biting a human host. And in the first probably 30 minutes to a few hours of being bitten by an infected mosquito, Parasites travel from the skin to the liver. Once within the liver, the parasite replicates for between five and seven days in the human host before parasites are released into the blood. And it's that blood stage of infection that is associated with the clinical symptoms that we're all familiar with, so the fever and the anemia uh, and the subsequent sequelae of uh, clinical infection. Most malaria vaccines have aimed at inducing antibodies against either the sporozoite stage or the blood stage. But what we're really interested in doing with a T-cell inducing vaccine is targeting the stage where the parasite's multiplying in the liver, because this is the one stage where obviously there's antigen presented in the context of MHC that can be recognised by uh, antigen-specific T-cells. And so that's really the aim of, of what we're doing here. So as I mentioned, the target age group for a malaria vaccine are infants. And um, most vaccines that we give are administered during infancy, but they primarily protect through induction of antibodies. Um, the main exception to this would probably be BCG, where we think efficacy is primarily mediated by CD4 T cells. But there are a number of diseases for which a CD8 T cell inducing vaccine would be really effective. So RSV, HIV, and of course, malaria at the liver stage. But we know that inducing um, CD8 T cells in the neonatal and infant period is really difficult, and there's an abundance of evidence in mice that shows that neonatal mice are defective in Th1 type responses, and that those responses that you can induce by vaccination tend to be skewed towards Th2 types. And we know from humans that a number of vaccines that are used in infancy uh, induce functional antibodies, but that the antigen-specific T cells that are induced are, are defective. They show reduced proliferation and poor production of interferon gamma from antigen-specific T cells. So we really have quite a limited understanding of how we induce CD8 T cell immunity uh, uh, in infants and neonates. And part of the reason for that, as this uh, schematic nicely shows, is that it's really a multifactorial problem that we don't understand particularly well. There are a number of factors affecting how we induce CD8 T cells in, uh, uh, in infancy. So there's the persistence of uh, fetal immunoregulatory responses, uh, there's the influence of maternal antibodies, there, um, there are fewer TMB cells generally, and also the influence of other effect infections that are required early in life, such as cytomegalovirus. And we think now probably that cytomegalovirus is one of the key factors that affects the induction of effective antibody responses during the infant period. 
So, as I mentioned, we're interested in inducing um, T cells, and the way we do that is using viral vectors. And viral vectors have been around for a long time now, and they're originally used um, to administer, uh, induce antigen specific T cell responses against flu. But what was discovered moving on from that was that T CD8 T cells could be most effectively. Um, induced using non-replicating viruses. So these are viruses that have had a large proportion of their genome deleted so that when they're immunized into the human host, they can uh, undergo a certain degree of uh, the uh, virus cycle, they can express the antigen that's of interest for the vaccine, but they can't undergo a full replication cycle and they're cleared by the immune system soon after immunization. But they are there long enough for that transgene to be expressed and processed through the normal cellular pathways uh, to be a target of um, natural, uh, naturally acquired immunity, naturally raised immunity. So taking this approach, our main um, malaria vaccine antigen is called Emitrap. So trap is a, a protein found on the surface of the sporozoite, which is really important for that process of the um, parasite invading the human hepatocyte. And because of that, it's an obvious target for a vaccine candidate at that stage of the ma malaria life cycle. So we've taken a construct of that protein and cloned it into two viral vectors one of which is this adenovirus here on the left-hand side. This is a simian adenovirus. And then we take the same uh, protein and clone it into another, oh, sorry, another virus, which is MVA, and this is the attenuated version of the smallpox virus that was used at the end of the smallpox elimination uh, campaign. It's been used widely. It has an excellent safety profile and it's been given to several hundred thousand people now. So if we take those two viruses, insert the transgene, and vaccinate people with it eight weeks apart, then we know that we can induce really potent T cells. And this has been shown not just for TRAP, for malaria, but for a number of other antigens as well, from a number of different pathogens, including Ebola, HIV, TB, and so on, and flu. And there's a number of reasons for using adenoviruses. So many of the early viral vectors, they used adenoviruses that were isolated from humans. But the problem with that is that we all get infected with adenoviruses all the time, uh, and therefore we have naturally acquired immunity to them, which means the immune system clears them before the transgene can be expressed and your immune response that you're trying to induce can be uh, uh, affected. But what we've done now is isolate adenoviruses from chimpanzees. And these have the advantages that obviously, because we don't come into contact with chimpanzees particularly often, we don't get infected with simian adenoviruses and we don't raise antibodies against them. Um, and this isn't particularly clear on the left-hand side, but if you look at a phylogenetic tree of one of the major proteins on the surface of an adenovirus, in this case the hexon, you look at their DNA sequences, this is the human adenovirus up here whereas the simian adenoviruses that we use are very genetically distinct from them, which means that you get very little cross-reactivity between antibodies against different species. And so for that reason, the seroprevalence of vector-neutralizing antibodies against simian adenoviruses is much lower. So if we look at children in the Gambia, or adults, or even UK adults, um, the prevalence of uh, anti-vector immunity is very low. And even more importantly, for the uh, anti-vector immunity that we do see against simian adenoviruses, although it's there in adults, it's much, much lower in children, and again, they're the target population that we're looking at here. So simian adenoviruses as vectors have now been used for a number of different um, approaches to immunisation for a number of different diseases. So at the top here, these are all the malaria vaccines that have been used um, with a number of different antigens against different stages of the parasite life cycle. Um, they've been used for HIV, they've been used for hepatitis, Ebola most recently, there's a PANAD3 vaccine against RSV that's been in uh, clinical trials now, and also for flu and tuberculosis. So these vectors have been widely used, they have an excellent safety profile, and they're very immunogenic for T-cells. So one of the advantages we have in the malaria field over other fields such as HIV or tuberculosis vaccine development is that we have a human challenge model. And that really speeds up the process of um, vaccine development because it means that at the early stage of clinical development, once we've demonstrated safety and immunogenicity, we can show proof of concept of a vaccine efficacy in a very small scale challenge model. So this involves vaccinating our volunteers with that eight week prime boost approach that I showed earlier. And then we expose people to the bites of infected um, malaria-infected mosquitoes, so they get five bites 
Um, you can see here, these are the mosquitoes in the coffee cup with a piece of gauze over the top, you put your arm over it, uh, the mosquito bites, and somewhere between 10 to 12 days later, um, you develop clinical malaria in the control group. We hope that obviously for the people we've vaccinated, they don't develop clinical malaria, but that's our readout at a very early stage of vaccine development for malaria. And what that allows us to do is down select candidates at an early stage. It provides proof of concept to funders to encourage them to fund us to go on and do larger efficacy studies in our target populations. So just going to digress here a little bit to talk about T cell assays in vaccine development. So clearly, if we're interested in inducing T cells, we have to be able to measure them in a meaningful and relevant way. And traditionally, this is done with LE spot and flow cytometry. Um, they're used widely to assess vaccine induced immunity, to understand immunogenicity, and to look at vaccine potency and efficacy. And they're really important in the uh, go no go decision making processes for T cell vaccines. <coughs> and they can allow us to do things like epitope mapping, which is something we've done for the Ebola virus glycoprotein for the first time in humans. Uh, and these are really the, the main things in our toolbox for T cell assays. But there are a number of factors that uh, affect T cell assay outcomes, and I've listed just a few of them here. Everything from sample quality, from how you prepare your sample, um, from data analysis, and clearly, you know, this has to be a very controlled process for clinical trials, particularly for multi-centre clinical trials. So when we take a vaccine from testing in Oxford out into the field in Burkina Faso, we have to know that the early spot assays that we do are going to read out in the same way and be comparable. Otherwise, it's very hard to directly compare the immunogenicity of a given vaccine in different populations and age groups. So we're not the only people to run into these types of issues. There have been consortia around for a number of years now looking at addressing some of these issues around assay harmonisation and standardisation. And a lot of this work has been led by the HIV field, who, uh, funded uh, by IRV and HVTN, tend to focus on cryopreserved assays for measuring um, not just uh, vaccine-induced immunity, but also uh, naturally acquired immunity to the HIV virus as well. And there are a number of advantage, advantages to cryopreserving T cells in that you can do it all in a centralised lab in a very controlled way. Um, but for malaria vaccines, at the moment, we don't really have that equivalent reference standard network. And early on in our vaccines, particularly for flu, it became apparent that we were really seeing very substantial differences between T cell responses from uh, cells that are assayed fresh or following cryopreservation at every time point uh, during the vaccine evaluation process. And as soon as we became aware of this, we then started to look at it in some of our other vaccine programs. And so, although it was clear at that point that there was an issue here, we decided to take the decision to continue doing fresh assays as our uh, primary readout rather than uh, choosing to cryopreserve everything and analyse it in a central lab. We then undertook a really formal analysis of this funded by the Gates Foundation who were very keen that we should have centralised labs which would mean you know, cryopreserving every, everything. And as you can see here, if you cryopreserve cells and test them with a mitogen like PHA, actually after cryopreservation the responses look slightly better. And that's probably because you're taking all the red cells out and we know that red cells bind lectin. And certainly for uh, antigens where you're chronically exposed, so something like cytomegalovirus, there's not much difference whether you look at the response in fresh PBMC or frozen PBMC. And I think some of the dogma around fresh versus frozen has come from fields where people are looking at long-term responses to ongoing viral infection. But when we're looking at responses to viral vectored vaccines, it's clear that this has a massive effect. And so for our lead antigen, which was TRAP, but also for another antigen we're interested in, which is CSP, Using frozen PBMC really reduces the magnitude of the response, particularly for the CD4 subset. So it didn't really affect CD8 T cell responses, but we lose um, one of the key populations for CD4 T cells, which is the population that express a combination of all three of the cytokines we're interested in, so interferon gamma, IL-2, and TNF-alpha. So this really reinforced what we'd always kind of felt intuitively, which was that fresh assays were better than frozen. So going back a bit now through the history of viral vectors, um, within the Jenner Institute under Adrian Hill, we've been developing vaccines using TRAP as an antigen for uh, over 15 years now. And the vector technology has really advanced. So in the early days, we started with a foul pox vaccine. This is a pox virus, uh, FP9. And when you give a couple of doses of that vaccine encoding TRAP, you get a pretty dismal response. So the next stage was to clone that trap antigen. 
into the MVA vector that I described earlier. And if you give three doses of that, again, you get a fairly measly response. Then we take it into DNA vaccines, again, it's a fairly dismal response. Once you start to introduce a heterologous prime boost approach, so these are uh, priming and boosting with two do or three doses of the same vaccine here, we're mixing uh, a heterologous vector in there. Immediately you can see that incremental increase in uh, vaccine immunogenicity. So these are all Ellie spot assays done in the same lab using the same protocol or using fresh PBMC. And this really allows us to see the increasing, uh, the incrementally increasing immunogenicity of the ve va viral vector vaccine technology as it improves over the years. So now here we are with the adenovirus, which is extremely immunogenic. But when you boost that with an MVA dose, then you get this great explosion in the antigen-specific T-cell response. But it's not just about immunogenicity for malaria. As I told you earlier, we need to see efficacy as well in that small-scale uh, CHMI model that I described to you before. And actually, um, Falpox priming boosted with MVA was the first regime that ever showed any efficacy in the human challenge model. 13% of malaria-naive people were protected using that regime. With ADENO-MVA, despite the massive increase in immunogenicity, it was a fairly modest increase in uh, protection in the small-scale CHMI models. Only 20% of UK volunteers were protected. But when we took that vaccine regime to Kenya and gave it to adults that had already some pre-existing immunity to malaria, in the short term, we could induce seven, nearly 70% efficacy in that group, which is really encouraging for transferring a, field, uh, a vaccine from a naive population into the field. So, as I've told you, we've induced some level of uh, protective immunity, and we were the first people to show a correlate of protection for this type of viral vector vaccine approach as, as well. So this is a, a although we um, saw a modest effect of antibodies against that antigen, actually the real correlate of protection with CD8 T cells expressing interferon gamma. And this is a first correlate of protection for a viral vector vaccine, but also the first correlate of protection against a parasite as well. So monofunctional CD8 T cells expressing interferon gamma correlate with protective efficacy, not just in this model, but in an animal model and another uh, human challenge model as well. So taking that forward, oh, it's scrambled my slide. That's interesting. So we took this vaccine forward into the field, into two of our field sites, one in the Gambia, which has been a long-standing partner of Oxford in malaria vaccine development, but also into a new site in Burkina Faso. So this is the Cascades region. This is Ouagadougou, the capital of Burkina Faso. We're right down here in Balfour. So Burkina is one of the world's poorest 10 countries uh, consistently. So, you know, trying to do clinical trials in these settings is a challenge, but given this is where the highest burden of disease is, obviously for us it's our most relevant population, so we put a lot of time and effort into getting these assays up and running in the field. And what we found was really interesting. So we know that often vaccines are less immunogenic in uh, malaria-exposed populations uh, than in naive, and that was certainly the case. So these vaccines are really immunogenic in UK and Gambian adults, but as you start to age de-escalate through two to six-year-olds down into one-year-olds, the immunogenicity declines substantially. But then when we give these viral vectors to babies that are 10 week old, all of a sudden we see these stellar T-cell responses, which was really surprising to us. And this is great news because obviously these are the t types of age groups of babies that we'd like to be vaccinating. The other thing that we thought is that, for those of you who are familiar with sort of childhood haematology, is that the number of lymphocytes in a mill of blood varies dramatically depending on what stage of your life you're at. So as you get older, the number of, uh, sorry, as you age de-escalate, the number of lymphocytes in a mill of blood increases massively. So in, you know, UK adults, it might be 2 million lymphocytes in a mill of blood. By the time you get into children in Africa, you might have 8 million lymphocytes in a mill of blood. So reading out early spot responses in a million PBMC becomes f physiologically irrelevant. So a PhD student in my group decided that she was going to integrate those two readouts, so spot-forming cells with a number of lymphocytes, and came up with this new way of reading out T-cell responses um, per mill of blood rather than per million PBMC. And if you look at the immunogenicity of TRAP uh, in 10 week old babies using that metric, it's approximately double that what we see in adults. So again, really good news. The other interesting thing 
was that in adults that we vaccinate with viral vectors encoding trap, we see fairly dismal antibody responses. So I told you that viral vectors were all about inducing T cells, but it would be great to have antibodies as well as another uh, uh, part of the armour against malaria. And what's really interesting, again, is that when you start to go down into these very young age groups here, we see really fantastic antibody responses to trap, and that was a big surprise to us. We expected to see nothing. And they're of the phenotype, they're IgG1, IgG3 uh, subtypes of antibodies that we would really like to see and are known to associate with protection in malaria. So finally, um, we've looked at administering these vaccines in the context of EPI. So EPI is the World Health Organization program of expanded immunizations in children. So these are the routine vaccinations that all children receive. And what we want to be sure of is that, firstly, we don't interfere with the immunogenicity of those vaccines, but also vice versa. We want to see that when we give those vaccines, uh, they're not compromised by uh, being administered with EPI as well. So we took this, undertook this study in the Gambia, looking in three groups of children, either aged 16 weeks, eight weeks, or one week at the age of their priming vaccination, with a booster dose given nine weeks after that. And then we looked at um, responses to EPI vaccines in all of those children at about six months of age. The EPI vaccine responses weren't affected at all. All of the children achieved um, protective levels, levels of um, antibodies against all of the EPI vaccines. And actually, the same was true for T cell and antibody responses as well. We saw good seroconversion of, for, for uh, antibody responses. And although the responses were slightly lower than what we'd seen in the, present, uh, in the absence of EPI vaccines, they weren't significantly different. So even when we administer these vaccines along with the EPI vaccines, we can still induce really good immunogenicity. And I told you earlier that about that correlate of protection, the T-cell correlate of protection, the CD8 phenotype that we know protect um, from liver stage malaria. And we can also see fairly decent levels. So this is day 63. This is one week after the booster dose of the ME trap vaccine. And you can see that 92%, 86%, and 67% respectively of 16 week olds, eight week olds, and one week olds are able to elicit that type of T cell response that we know is associated with protection in adults, which I think is really promising going forward. The other thing we've been doing recently is looking at trying to shorten that prime boost interval because eight weeks is quite a long <coughs> interval uh, to wait between uh, two doses of vaccine in the EPI schedule. So we've now looked at trying to shorten those prime boost intervals down as well. What we've discovered is that actually you can give viral vectors uh, as little as one week apart and still induce a really good antibody and T-cell responses. So just to summarise, uh, the combination of viral vector vaccines that I've described here is very well tolerated in children and infants and neonates as young as one week old in the Gambia and Burkina Faso, and it induces potent T-cell responses in infants. And that we think this per mil analysis for reading out any spot responses is probably more physiologically re relevant than the traditional types of readouts that we've used in the past. We've also shown induction of very high titer and high avidity anti trap IgG responses uh, using prime boost vaccination in contrast to what we know to be true in adults, and that there was no impact of these vaccines on EPI vaccine immunogenicity as well. Um, I showed you at the beginning that complex life cycle of malaria, and clearly although 20%, 60% in different populations for the liver stage vaccine is encouraging, it's not going to be enough, and it's not going to get us over the line of the malaria va vaccine technology funders' roadmap target of 75% that I mentioned to you earlier. So what we think is likely to be required is a combination approach with different vaccine products targeting different stages of the life cycle with any trap targeting the liver stage, another sporozoite vaccine candidate targeting that early stage prior to hepatic infection, and possibly a, a transmission blocking vaccine component as well. So we're getting there with the first stage of that combination vaccine, but clearly there's a lot more work to be done. So I'd like to finish with some <coughs> acknowledgements. I've described the work of a huge number of people here, but um, I couldn't, uh, uh, they all contribute a massive amount, and of course all of the volunteers, their parents and their carers as well. Thank you. I'm just about to